here, and I won't say more about it than you himself, but I'm the chair of the Dumberson Conservation Commission, who is one of the speakers <coughs> of this event, and along with the Bonneville Environmental Education Center. Patty's over here. So let me just give a, a little bit of uh, an introduction about myself, and then what these four sessions will be about, and then I'll get right into the material. Um, I think people best know me probably from my work as a forest ecologist, but I'm pretty generalized in my interests, so I have a strong interest in desert ecosystems, uh, alpine ecosystems, Arctic ecosystems, very strong interest in geomorphology, evolutionary ecology, molecular genetics, um, complex system science, the interface of landscape and culture, because culture influences land and seascapes, and in return, they influence culture. Um, so I tend to be pretty interdisciplinary in my interests, and that allows me to cross boundaries. Um, and so what we're going to be doing in this, this mini class of these four two-hour sessions is crossing boundaries. Um, today, we're going to start with complex system science, because I think it's really important when you're thinking about um, sustainable systems, you have to understand complexity. Uh, and we're not very well versed in our culture in understanding this, because we've been all sort of raised in a linear reductionistic paradigm. That's sort of the, the framing of our science, and it doesn't just frame our science, it tends to frame our whole world. Here. And so, um, and since everything we engage in is a complex system, we really need to shift our way of visualizing how, how systems function. So we're going to get into that a bit this morning. Then we're going to start, well, wading into two critical scientific principles that relate to um, sustainability, the, the second law of thermodynamics, is that will frame why our current trajectory um, as a society is not sustainable. Um, and then we'll shift to the, the, the principle of self-organization, because that is such a wonderful model for how sustainable systems function. So when you understand it, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you just can apply it. Um, and we'll be looking at self-organization through an ecological lens. We think it offers a real good way of seeing how this works, as well as a really wonderful model of how you can apply self-organization to human systems, whether it's an organizational system, an economy, a community, it really doesn't matter. Um, so that's sort of uh, the framing we'll be looking at. So the three major parts are um, complex system science, these two principles, scientific principles, uh, both second law thermodynamics and self-organization, and then using those as a means to set up a frame for how to think about sustainability in human systems. Um, the bulk of the materials will be scientific and ecologically oriented, uh, but the last session will be diving in quite a bit to applying all this to, to uh, human systems. So that's what I'm hoping to do in these, these four sessions. So I think I will just start with complex systems science. Now, um, the natural sciences and Western science were very much dominated by Aristotle's thinking for almost 2,000 years. And at the core of Aristotle's work was this concept that he called entelechy. And what that was, Aristotle said, if you really want to understand the natural world, you have to look at pattern and process. Because what is constant out in the natural world is everything is always in a state of change. Nothing is static. And so if you really want to get a handle on how the natural world works, you've really got to have a large scale, sort of holistic view of looking at patterns and processes and how they change through time. And that was really critical to sort of Western scientific understanding until about 1600. And then Galileo's work started shifting things. Galileo started looking at planets as being pieces of a system. But he wasn't looking at the whole system. He started focusing on individual planet dynamics. And then uh, at the same, in the same century came Rene Descartes. Now Descartes was very influenced by mechanical contrivances of his day. Uh, Wind-up clocks, uh, windmills, uh, water-driven sawmills and grist mills. And he came to think that these mechanical things that moved on their own <laughs> by taking in some sort of form of energy, were really no different from anything in nature. And he started looking at everything in nature as being very mechanistic, that he thought 
an organism was really no different than a, a wind up clock. And he said to really understand systems, what you really need to do is you need to identify all the parts in the system and the way they interact. And so that really gave rise, he was the one that really codified linear reductionism, which was, all right, you want to understand something, you have to take it apart. Figure out all the parts and then try to figure out how they interact. Um, but what was lost in this framing, because Descartes really saw a system the sum of the parts being equal to the whole. And what was lost is that really in complex systems, uh, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts because complex systems have what are called emergent properties. So in the late 19th century, coming into the early 20th century, there are a number of people doing research in various disciplines, sociology, anthropology, psychology, biology, ecology, cybernetics. Interestingly enough, no one from the economic sector, which really intrigues me, but all these other disciplines, um, researchers are saying, you know, this linear reductionistic approach is not helping us understand the subjects we're studying. And so about in the middle of the, of the, uh, the, the 20th century, uh, at the close of World War II and the years following, a conference was organized in New York City called the Macy Conferences. And these brought researchers from all these various disciplines together to start talking and just sharing what they're seeing in their subject systems. And what they started to realize, it didn't matter if they were working in anthropology, sociology, ecology, cybernetics, whatever, it really didn't matter. The same patterns and processes, they were all observing the exact same thing. And what came out of this was a new sort of paradigmatic approach to science called complex system science. Um, and actually, at first, it was called chaos theory because uh, linear systems are thought to be very predictable. If you know the parts and how they interact, you should be able to predict what that system will be doing at any point in time. And with complex systems, it was noticed you couldn't do that because um, they have feedback and the internal dynamics are shifting and you can never pin them down. So people thought, well, gee, they're just sort of fluey and they call them chaos. But then researchers started to realize that these things aren't really chaotic. If you move back to large time frames, their behaviors are very conservative. You just can't predict what they're gonna do at any point in time, but you can make good predictions over large time frames. So, that name, chaos theory, by 1970s was pushed out and replaced by complex system science. What the beauty is with complex system science is that the same principles apply to any system. It means it makes it very easy to move from one system to another and across disciplines as the same patterns and processes are at play. It doesn't really matter, um, and that's that's one of the beauties. So, a linear system is a system where the parts interact in a lockstep way. Part A will interact with part B, part B with part C, part you know C with part D. They are in a static sort of uh, relationship. It can't change. So if you think of a, a clock with all the gears in it and everything, those gears are all interacting in a lockstep fashion. And that makes the system linear. Because if you know, um, let's say in a clock, how many times one of those gears is gonna make a complete turn, you can predict exactly where the hands will be on the clock. Uh, because again, they work in a lockstep way. Uh, complex systems are different in the sole fact that their parts do not interact in a complex, I mean, in a, in a fixed way. Part A can interact with part B or part C or part D or any part, depending on what the internal dynamics of the system are. And that just slight change of having the parts not work in a lockstep way, but being able to work in a multitude of varying ways based on the internal dynamics means these systems are not static. They are constantly feeding back internally. And that feedback is shifting what is happening at every point in time and can give rise to all sorts of new things like emergent properties that you can never predict by just looking at the parts and how they interact. Um, and when we think of it, Everything around us is a complex system. In fact, linear systems may just be a conceptual idea. Now, if we could take something like this heater system, which is a linear system, you know, we have a thermostat somewhere in this room, and it's set maybe at, you know, 68 or 70 degrees. When the temperature gets up above that level by a few degrees, the heater shuts off. 
Then when the temperature drops down maybe two degrees below the desired temperature, the, the heater kicks back on. And it keeps that, this, this room at a fairly even level. Um, that would be linear because the parts are interacting in a lockstep way, but the problem is this room is not isolated from the external environment. Uh, we open those blinds over there, sunlight comes in, that's going to be another factor that's going to affect when this heater's going to kick on or kick off. And already, just because of the fact that this room is not isolated, it starts becoming complex. So it may be, in fact, that linear, linearity is just a conceptual idea. Um, it'd be very hard to really find a true linear system because all linear systems are nested in other systems that are influencing them. And they can't always interact in that lockstep way. Uh, but in any case, all the systems we do interact with, they are complex. We right here in this room are a complex system. Uh, we cannot predict what anyone is going to do in this room in terms of their body movements. Because we start influencing each other. You know, someone shifts their body position, someone else has to shift theirs, someone else has to shift theirs. You can't predict it because we can all interact in, in all sorts of different ways, all based on what's happening at one point in time. So is this making sense to people? All right, so the key is that um, complex systems just differ because the parts interact in various ways uh, based on the internal dynamics. And everything we look at around us is a complex system. Yeah, question? Yeah, about the difference between an Aristotelian worldview and what you're describing as a linear. Um, um, Aristotle had defined different kinds of change, categories of change. Mm -hmm. and. One first, I guess, was locomotion change of place, which was measurable. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is is it? Could you say that another aspect of this linear type of system is that changes the effort to quantify change and define whatever change has happened in terms of quantity, mass, or change of position, or something like that. That that breakdown of phenomena is what's typical in Western science, what changed in Western science. It happened with Newton and mm -hmm. the laws of motion. Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. So the, the comment, if everyone didn't hear it, was that um, in, in Western science, this, this desire to quantify. And when you start quantifying, you do. You start really putting in. Um, you insert sort of into complex systems uh, approaches that start to break down that holistic view. You're starting to look at it more piecemeal. <coughs> and uh, what we understand, if you really want to understand complex systems, you have to look at a large scale and look at pattern behavior. And it, it's you can't really do, it's like qualitative work it's been more than quantitative. So you're absolutely right. Um, once we start really trying to quantify, we start moving out of sort of that really overarching holistic view of what's going on in the system. Because these things are all tied in together. So if we try to quantify you know, speed of locomotion, we start missing other aspects of the interactions just through that process. You're absolutely correct about that. Yeah. Well, I just uh, it just yeah, kind of address the point. My concern was, how does a complex system address uh, how, how does a complex system address quality? Change? How does it address? Because it's from which way? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's you know it is hard for us because we are all have been trained in linear, <coughs> it's, you know, so we tend to be trained to focus on the parts and take things apart. Um, but the key is that really, yes, to understand complex systems, it really involves qualitative, large scale. Uh, work of looking at pattern behavior um, uh, over time and just really getting a sense of how that's working. So uh, it does mean a, a real shift in how we view the world and how we look at things and how we think about things. And it's not necessarily an easy shift because our, our educational training has been so much focused in, a, in a linear reductionist paradigm. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Now, when we're to look at systems, we're going to see they're nested. Um, one system nested within another. So for example, in our bodies, we have mitochondria that are nested within our cells. 
our cells are nested within tissues or organs. Those are nested within our whole organismic body. Us, as humans, are nested in populations or communities of humans, which are nested within ecosystems, which are nested within the biosphere. Um, so everything finds itself nested within something else. Um, and I guess the largest nest we know of would probably be the universe. Um, but that may be nested in even larger structures. We just don't know. Actually, one of the current best sort of cosmological theories is that universes get spawned in black holes of other universes. And if that's true, then we would, our universe would be in the black hole of a larger universe, which would be in the black hole in, 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 in uh, yeah, yes, it's my ball. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not going to go there because, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to do with that. But um, everything is nested. So when you're dealing with complexity, it becomes really important to be facile at being to shift scales. Whenever we can scale up to go to a larger scale, that's going to build context for whatever, you know, maybe system problem we're looking at. Whenever we can shift down to a smaller scale, that can give us specific information about intervention points in a complex system. So let me give you an example about scaling up. I'll do one temporally and I'll do one spatially. Um, so right now, we have issues con concerning climate change. So the question becomes, well, what is the real issue we have to be concerned about with climate change? To address that, we need to scale up. So if we go back 18,000 years ago, 18,000 years before present, um, we were at the last glacial maximum. Now, many people don't understand this. Um, we are today in an ice age. Uh, the Earth has been in an ice age for probably about 10 to 15 million years. And ice ages are defined when one or both poles are capped in ice. And Antarctica, we know, has probably had ice masses on it for at least 10 to 15 million years. That means that's what brought us into this current ice age. We know of two previous ice ages we have evidence of uh, historically. And they're all pretty much brought about when you get continental drift creating conditions where you get an isolated continent over a pole, like Antarctica, which is completely surrounded by ocean, or an isolated ocean over a pole, like the Arctic Ocean, that's surrounded by land. Uh, when you get those sorts of configurations, then you can build up these ice caps on either pole, and once that happens, you're in an ice age. So we are in an ice age, even though we're witnessing warming climates. Uh, now, in the last million years of this ice age, the Earth climatological system has fallen into a pattern where for about 100 to 120,000 years, we have global glaciation, where large ice sheets are spawned in North America and Eurasia, grow out to immense size, which are then truncated by very rapid warming of interglacial climates, where those ice sheets melt away, the Earth warms up, only to fall into another glaciation. We've had at least eight of those, uh, maybe as many as 20, we're not sure, and the pattern is getting stronger and stronger with each cycle. So right now, even though we're in an ice age, we're at the close of an interglacial, and unless things remarkably change, uh, we'll probably go back into another glaciation where uh, continental glaciers will start to be spawned here in North America. Uh, and they'll grow out for over 100,000 years, only to eventually uh, have another interglacial kick in. So 18,000 years ago was the height of the last glaciation. At that point, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, the large continental glacier in North America, had stretched all the way down to the southern shore of Long Island, the southern coast of Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, the lower arm of the Cape. And at that point, global temperatures the mean global temperature was 51 degrees Fahrenheit. So that was the coldest point during the last glaciation. And then we started entering this current interglacial. <coughs> and what brings these about, that the norm is glaciation. Right now during this ice age, the norm is glaciation, the interglacials, which basically contains all of you know, recent human history, uh, is the anomalous period. What we see today is not the norm. The norm for this part of Vermont is either being covered in glacial ice, uh, Arctic tundra, or boreal forest. Uh, seeing you know hardwood forests out here, that is not normal. 
only about 4% of the time does Vermont look like this over the last 2 million years. So we're in that anomalous time frame. So what brings about these interglacials? Because the anomaly is when we get a certain configuration of the Earth in relationship to the Sun. Now there are three eccentricities that the Earth is involved in as it orbits around the Sun. One is a roughly 100,000 year cycle where the orbit of the Earth around the Sun goes from circular to more elliptical and then back to circular. That's about a 100,000 year cycle. So about every 100,000 years, the orbit of the Earth is doing something like this. All right? There's another cycle that lasts about um, 40,000 years. And these are not that, that specific, but I'm just rounding them off. And that is a cycle where the um, axis of the Earth goes from a maximum of 24 and a half degrees to a minimum of 22 and a half degrees back to a maximum. So our Earth, you know, the axis is tilted and it's sort of doing something like this about every 40,000 years. And then the last eccentricity is about a 20,000 year cycle where Due to all the gravitational pull of the inner planets, the axis of the Earth is actually sort of making a turn about every 20,000 years, almost like a top that's slowing and starting to wobble. But it's not because we're slowing and wobbling, it's just because of all the inner pull of the planets. That wobble is what determines during what season the Earth is closest to the sun in the northern hemisphere. Right now, we are closest to the sun in the winter time in the northern hemisphere. But we're tipped away from the sun. The sun's over here, that's why we have winter. But um, basically 11,000 years ago and another 9,000 years from now, that wobble is gonna have us so that we're gonna be tipped towards the sun and closest to it, making it summertime. We'll be close to the sun during the summertime. So that wobble influences this thing. So when these things come to alignment, where the orbit of the Earth is at its most elliptical. And I should mention the sun is not right in the middle of this ellipse. When the tilt of the axis is at its maximum, 24 and a half degrees, and the wobble has us so we're closest to the sun during our northern hemisphere summer, that's what brings on interglacials. Because now we're getting an incredible gain in sunlight in the summertime, which is causing the melting of the glacial ice. But then in the winter, we're as far away from the sun as we can get, and we're tipped as far away from it as we can get, and our winters get exceedingly cold. When you have really cold winters, that means you have very little precipitation. So in the winters, snow is not accruing. The summers, it's melting, and that's what brings on an interglacial. But going back, the whole discussion here is about scaling. I don't want to lose that. I just want to get back to this notion of scaling up to build context. So, in any case, we are at the glacial maximum 18,000 years ago. Global temperature is 51 degrees, but then these cycles, which are called the Milankovitch cycles, start to come into this configuration. That brought on the interglacial, and by 6,000 years ago, the interglacial reached its warmest temperatures, where mean global temperature was now 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that, was, that was what's called the Hipsy Thermal, the maximal temperature of the interglacial. We have actually surpassed that again this century because of human-induced um, aspects to the, to the climate. But the key is, it took 12,000 years for global temperature to go up to 9 degrees. That is the most rapid climate change that we have witnessed in probably, you know, maybe 65 million years. That's as fast as it goes. Um, we have now warmed over a degree in less than a century. Uh, so what the context is, by scaling up, this is scaling up to larger temporal scales, what it tells us is the issue with climate change is not that it's getting warmer. Matter of fact, the Earth has been way warmer than it's going to get with anything we do. It's the rate of change. We're looking at a rate of change that's about 80 to 100 times faster than the fastest sorts of climate change we've ever witnessed. And that's the issue, because that means how do systems adjust to such a fast rate of change? Right? 
right? So that's just an example of scaling up gives you context. When you're looking at a complex system, you go up to a larger nested thing. In this case, we're going up and scaling up in time to look now at time in thousands of years. And that gives us the context for what we're looking at. Now, if you want to find intervention points, you scale down. So let me use a spatial example here uh, for this, for both scaling up and scaling down. Um, across the river, we have Pisgah State Park at over 13,000 acres. Um, it is the second largest state park in New England. Only Baxter up in Maine is bigger. And it was set up as a wilderness state park with federal funds. So it's the only state park in probably the Northeast and maybe the whole country for that matter that has no amenities. It just has trailhead parking areas and hiking trails and woods roads. But there's no bath facilities, no camping facilities, no concessions, nothing like that. It's the only park like that. Well, when we went into that real difficult situation in 2008 financially, and the state of New Hampshire was really hurting economically, the Department of um, Recreation and Economic Development decided that Pisgah should be logged. Um, as a means to generate revenue. And the, 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 the rationale they gave was, well, that Pisgah um, is a forest that's an older forest, and we really should log <coughs> to make younger, early successional forests to you know, benefit you know, the plants and wildlife that need those early successional things. And I think you know, there's, there's probably a, a sound case for that. But to really know if that's accurate, what we'd want to do is we'd want to scale up to a larger spatial area and say, all right, here's 13,000 acres of Pisgah. Let's look at a 100,000 acre area surrounding it. And let's see, is there limited early successional forest? And if there is, then yes, I think that'd be a good context for maybe doing some logging in, in Pisgah to do that. If it's not, that might then say, well, gee, you know, maybe Pisgah isn't the right place because it has a very old forest, which is different from everything else around us, and the western side of it was never open for agriculture, making it the largest block of low elevation forest that's always been forest. Over 6,000 acres, and there's a lot of embedded old growth in there and stuff. So scaling up would give us context. So let's say we scale up, and yes, it starts to make sense to log in Pisgah. Then what you'd want to do is you'd want to scale down to find intervention points. So let's say the state says, well, we're going to log over here, here, and here. Then what should happen is people should go to those sites and peruse them to see if they're, you know, what the status of it, uh, aggressive invasive plants are. And if we find there's a, a good establishment of aggressive invasive plants in those sites, that would say, no, we don't want to log there. We want to log somewhere else. We're not going to cause those things to explode and, and really take off. So again, scaling because of nested is very important. When we scale up, we gain context about the complex system. When we scale down, we can get information about intervention points. And in this way, if we have issues we're dealing with, these are really important things to keep in mind um, in terms of how to address those issues. We need to understand context and we need to look at intervention points. So is that making sense to people? All right, yes. How would that be analogous to say um, disease in a human body? Or I'm not quite clear. It's completely analogous. Yeah. So, you know, again, because of our sort of um, linear reductionist background, um, our traditional approach in Western society to disease is focusing on just that disease and trying to work with just that disease. But we're a complex system, so we're not getting the context. You would really want to go and look at large scale context to really get a better sense of, okay, why does this individual have this disease? What may be going on here? Um, so, and, and a lot of times, I don't think a lot of our MDs are trained that way um, to really look at, at context. And then, um, with that, scaling down and finding best intervention points, which could then really decide, well, maybe what the best treatment is. And it might not just be the standard treatment of this is what we do with this disease. Um, so it's, it is a matter of really developing that scaling approach. Any other questions or comments? So does people feel comfortable about this material so far? All right. Then we'll go on. So what I'd like to go into next is looking at um, feedback loops in complex systems. And we have basically two types of feedback that have been identified 
and they're co it's commonly called positive feedback and negative feedback. And these are not good terms because one denotes that it's a good thing and one denotes that it's a bad thing. And that's not the case at all. Depending on the context we're looking at, both can be very beneficial. And under a different context, both can be very bad. Uh, but the names got put into place um, by the way the system works. And, that, and, and, and maybe I can explain this a little bit more. But we'll look at negative feedback first. So let's say um, in negative feedback, and maybe one of these markers works better than this one. This one works better. Um, in negative feedback, let me just use that example of the heater. So here we have uh, room temperature. And we have, let's say, a thermostat. And we have a heater. And these are now the three major elements of the system. And again, this is going to be uh, negative feedback. All right, so let's say the room temperature goes down. It goes down low enough that it activates the thermostat. So temperature's going down, but the thermostat gets kicked on, which in turn kicks on the heater. The temperature in the room drifts up, and what happens next is all these elements do the opposite thing for what they just did. When the temperature goes up, now the room temperature uh, goes up, the thermostat is shut down, which shuts the heater down. Then the room temperature goes down, it turns the thermostat on. So each time we go around this loop, all the elements are doing the reverse. And this was called uh, sort of the steersman approach by the individual who identified uh, negative feedback, which was Norbert Weiner. He was an amazing scientist who lived up in Sandwich, uh, New Hampshire, until not very long ago. But he said, basically, if you're in a sailboat, you're using negative feedback to work your course. So you're, you're wanting to go over here. That's where you're going. So you have your tiller. And as you start to drift off, you pull the tiller this way. That brings you back. But you usually overcompensate. And you have to put it this way. So he said, each time you're moving the tiller, you're negating what you did the previous time. And that's why he said it's negative feedback. And that's what's happening. Each time we go around this loop, the elements negate what they did the time before, each time. And what that does is that keeps the system on a very steady, even keel. So negative feedback is really appropriate when we have systems that have reached maturity. Like all of us, our bodies are mostly ruled by negative feedback. Keeping our internal bodily environment on a very, very even keel course. So temperature right at 98.6. You know, blood pH right at 6.8. Blood sugar levels, all of it carefully controlled through negative feedback. Now, those things aren't static. The temperature's going up a little bit, dropping a little bit, pH going up and dropping, sugar levels going up and dropping, but we're constantly, through negative feedback, keeping that all very even keeled. So, in mature systems, negative feedback, a really healthy thing. We do not want to get, in our bodily environment, positive feedback, which is going to push the system in an iterative, uh, directional way, because that eventually could really lead to catastrophic results. So in mature systems, negative feedback, very, very important, keeping a nice, even keel, steady state thing. And probably a better name for this is self-regulating feedback. That might be the better term, because it's, it's keeping the, the system self-regulated at a very even pace. But Norbert Weiner called it negative feedback, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but again, very appropriate. Now, not appropriate in a system that's undergoing its developmental phases. Um, any system that is developing, you don't want negative feedback, because that's going to keep the system from developing. You're going to want positive feedback, which is going to lead to what are called bifurcation events, where the whole system behavior changes and is elevated to a new level of complexity. So um, an example of that would be, let's say we look at democracy in this country set up by the founders um, basically as uh, you know a citizen run government but it was a very incomplete sort of democracy I mean the only people who were involved in the democracy were white landowning males 
a very small segment of the population. Luckily for us, we have had a number of different social movements which have elevated and developed our democracy to a, a, to, to a greater fullness. I mean, it still has a, a good way to go, but we've seen major strides. So back in the late 1840s, some women decided, hey, you know, this is not fair. We can't vote. We have no rights of ownership. And they started pushing for women's suffrage. And what that generated was a positive feedback loop that started gaining momentum. Now, these things don't happen quickly, but they have to build momentum, build momentum. It's pushing the system, pushing the system, pushing the system, and eventually get in the 1920s, and we reach what's called a bifurcation, where the system flips, and overnight, the Congress gives women the right to vote. Uh, same thing with the civil rights movement going through the 60s, and more recently, for same-sex marriages, which have you know, just really happened very quickly in the last couple of years. Uh, what it's doing is it's, our, it's building our democracy to be more inclusive in a better democracy. Now, of course, there's other forces at play that are working against that, but those, all those movements came about through positive feedback loops, which pushed the system, pushed the system. When the system gets pushed far enough, they, systems want to keep their conservative behavior. When they get pushed far enough, they flip in what is called a bifurcation. Um, so a bifurcation is, is a, a flipping of the system And that is really appropriate in developmental systems. So for example, um, we're all very lucky we made it through gastrulation. I think you all probably remember this phase, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Only two out of three human embryos make it through gastrulation. Uh, one third don't, and women don't even know they were pregnant. What gastrulation is, after a, a egg becomes fertilized and starts its divisional process, that egg doesn't grow in size, but the number of cells in it increase in number as the cells get smaller and smaller. So eventually, you get this gastrula, which is this ball of cells that's hollow on the inside, filled with fluid. Now, there is positive feedback happening between all those cells in that very young, few-day-old embryo. And when the feedback gets to the right point, a bifurcation occurs where that embryo folds in and now allows for the development of endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. It starts the process of that embryo uh, now having differentiated cell types. Same thing happened with the development of our brain, of, you know, sort of the preliminary of our brain and notochord. That all happened through another bifurcation that brought about by positive feedback. Same thing with limb buds coming out and starting to develop our arms and legs. All those developmental things in our developmental process were run by positive feedback loops, giving rise to bifurcation events that quickly changed the system and increased its complexity. Um, so positive feedback is very, very important in developmenting, developmentally uh, working systems, systems that are developing. However, not good in mature systems that want to maintain their even keel. So let me map out a, a positive feedback loop. And what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to look at uh, the status of Arctic sea ice up in the Arctic Ocean. So right up here we have, we'll start with the temperature. So this is Arctic temperature. That right now is going up. And due to climate change, uh, climate change is not an egalitarian process. All parts of the globe warm at the same rate. Uh, the equator is not warming hardly at all but northern latitudes, especially places like Alaska, are seeing the most significant warming. So because temperatures are going up, that means what we're seeing is sea ice in the Arctic Ocean is declining. As sea ice goes down, that means albedo um, also goes down. So albedo is the amount of sunlight that reflects off of the ice back into outer space. So as the ice is reduced and more water is available, more sunlight is being absorbed. So as albedo goes down, uh, basically water temperature goes up. Which then drives even more melting of sea ice. 
Now, in this loop, every time we go around, the elements do not flip their behavior. They just become reinforced and more reinforced and more reinforced. And so the system is getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And eventually, it may cause a bifurcation where a whole sort of northern hemisphere climate system may flip in some way we can't really predict. Um, so that, that is a real concern because we're working towards a bifurcation, which we don't know what that will mean, how that will play out. Now, we can actually link another uh, positive feedback loop on here. So let's link one where Arctic temperature is going up, which means now that permafrost is declining in the Arctic. As permafrost declines, methane release increases. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, which means heat trapping. increases, which now means Arctic temperatures will be increasing even more. So now we have two positive feedback loops influencing each other, exacerbating the warming and making it even more dramatic and pushing it further and further away. But again, the key is that every time we go around these loops, the elements don't reverse. They stay moving in the same direction. That just pushes and pushes and pushes the system. So a better term for positive feedback, which we have here, is in this instance, it may not be positive at all, um, is self-reinforcing. Each turn around the loop reinforces the system moving away from its status quo, moving it towards a bifurcation. In peer-reviewed journals, every bit of research that gets published has been reviewed by other people that do that sort of research, and they're really looking for any bias to see if they can find it. So they're saying, all right, the, the type of question this person's addressing with the right research protocols employed, was there a robust enough data set collected? Were the right statistics used? And if they can't find any fault in the way the research was done, it gets published. Um, and it's, it's pretty reliable. Now, for example, uh, the, the second law of thermodynamics, <coughs> a law that you know has been tested since the middle 1800s has always stood up. Um, Science would tell us, well, it may be that that law won't stand up. Maybe in a part of the universe it isn't working. But let's, like, let's look at the first law. The first law is the law of conservation of energy. It says, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. Every time that's been tested, we find, yes, we can't create or destroy energy. We can change it, but we can't get rid of it, or we can't make it. Uh, but maybe somewhere in the universe where we can't perceive right now, energy is being created or energy is being destroyed. If we find that, that law comes tumbling down. Um, but that doesn't mean that science doesn't have value, because if someone came to me and said, you know, we're gonna test um, that, that first law of thermodynamics tomorrow. If you wanna bet money on it, you can bet whatever amount you want. If someone came up to me, I'd, I'd bet everything I own. Say, okay, yeah, I'll take that 99.99999% chance that the law is gonna be held up, because, you know, that's, and so, that's where I think peer review becomes important, and that's why if you can get the sort of sort of digested abstracts of a lot of that peer-reviewed stuff, you're gonna get a real good sense of what is going on, where they're seeing the significant change, where the areas are that we really need to be watching. You can have these things happening. This point it becomes really important at what scale you're working at, because at one scale, it's gonna be negative, and you shift to another, you might see it's gonna change. So for example, um, reindeer were uh, put onto uh, St. Matthew's Island out in the Bering Sea during World War II because they had a radar base out there and they brought reindeer out there so they had food supply for the, for the Americans manning that radar base. Now, reindeer had never been on that island and there is no biological control mechanism for controlling their numbers. So, the reindeer underwent a positive feedback loop because nothing was controlling their numbers. You know, they would have offspring, the offspring broke, they'd have offspring, more and more offspring, more and more offspring. It's a positive feedback loop getting to the point where the bifurcation was that, you know, after about um, 15, 20 years, the population of 24 reindeer had gone up to over 6,000, and they completely decimated their forage supply. And so a harsh winter came along, and the population crashed. That was the bifurcation. So you had a positive feedback loop driving this dramatic population growth, going way beyond the carry capacity of the system, hit the bifurcation, and the population crashed. 
So positive feedback loop if you're like the reindeer herd. But if you scale up to the larger ecosystem, what you're seeing is negative feedback. As the population goes up, forage goes down, and eventually the degradation of that ecosystem forces us through negative feedback to crash that population level. So scaling becomes really important. You have to know what scale you're working at, but you can see that you can be looking at the exact same phenomenon at one scale, it's negative, and the next it's positive. So that's a phenomenon with, with positive feedback where when you start to get enough critical mass, it means the system can start to flip in its behavior. And again, here's why when you're looking at complex systems, that's why you want to focus on large scale pattern behavior to see what's, what's happening. Um, you can scale down to find intervention points, but you always have to be looking at that large scale pattern behavior. Whenever you have an odd number of inverse linkages, so this is an inverse linkage right here, temperature's going down, thermostat's being turned on. This is another, um, uh, here, right here, we'll look at the arrows on this side. This one now is a direct linkage, it's not inverse. As thermostat goes on, heater goes on. As thermostat goes off, heater goes on. And this over here um, is also now a direct linkage. So as heater goes on, room temperature goes up. As heater goes off, room temperature goes down. In this case, we have an odd number of inverse linkages. That always means you're going to be a negative feedback. When you don't have an odd number, you have an even number of inverse linkages, it always means you have a positive feedback. Because this odd number means the elements are going to flip their behavior every time around. If you have an even number, they're not. So in this case here, temperature goes up, sea ice goes down. That's an inverse linkage. Um, sea ice goes down, albedo goes down. That's a direct linkage. Albedo goes down, water temperature goes up. That's an inverse linkage. Water temperature goes up, arctic temperature goes up. That's direct. Here we have now two inverse linkages. That's an even number. That means this will always remain a positive feedback. Can an earthquake be explained? Yes, so earthquake can. Which feedback loop causes an earthquake, positive or negative? No. Negative. No, positive. Because remember, in an earthquake, what you're doing is you have this consistent building up of pressure. So that, that tsunami that happened over in Japan a couple of years ago, um, the Pacific Crustal Plate went under the Japanese plate, because the Pacific Crust was heavier, got pushed under the Japanese plate. It's believed uh, 900 feet of displacement over eight centuries, which meant that all that rock on that Japanese plate was being pushed back like this. The pressure was building, building. You reach the bifurcation, and all of a sudden, that oceanic crust of the, of, the, of, the, of the Japanese plate went up a few hundred feet instantaneously. And that displaced all the water that caused the tsunami. So that would get a positive feedback loop where as every century going by, you're building up the pressure, the pressure's building, the pressure's building, it gets to the point the crustal rock can't hold it, you have the bifurcation, and boom, the earthquake and the tsunami. Yeah? Yeah, I'm just fascinated by this this is all pretty new stuff to me. And hey, believe it, not just you. <laughs> I've been teaching complex system science for 20 years to graduate students, and I have yet to really get anyone coming out of undergraduate institutions that has any background in this. Well, what I'm fascinated with as a, um, as a student of, of very minor student of theology is how this fits with process theology. Mm -hmm. And I think it does, and I'm really excited about it, so thank you. Very cool. And I don't doubt it does. You know, I think, um, you know, I think Western scientists are sometimes the last ones to come across this stuff. And eventually yeah. we get there. <laughs> but I think that a lot of this was intuited by other traditions way before we understood it. Obviously, for 400 years, we had no idea about any of this. Um, yeah. Our world, if you look at the Newtonian world, was something very concrete, predictable. Exist. No, no, they definitely exist. So, so what happens to that one that you just mapped when you've taken the sun? Okay. Um, so, we can still have the system functioning. That heater is still going to go on and off, room temperature is still going to adjust, whatever else. What you lose, because the system, which is pretty linear, the parts are interacting in a lockstep way, 
what you lose is, if it was complete, this room was completely isolated, that would be a very predictable system. We could predict exactly at what time the heater was going to turn on and what time it was going to shut off. But it's not. It's nested in a larger environment, and that's influencing in the, that system and making it move away from its linear air, linearity. Just by having that sunlight coming through that window is going to affect the timing of that heater turning on and off. The cloud comes over, that's going to affect it. You know, so um, because we're nested, the system isn't truly linear, even though it's set up as a linear system. But the feedback's the same. It's still negative feedback. It just, you know, we're moving from a linear system with negative feedback and one that's becoming non. Yeah. So just to summarize for myself here, bifurcation is something that happens as a result of positive feedback. And in a greater scale, is that always considered a negative feedback homeostasis kind of moment where it's kicking back? No, what it, what it means is the system has now bifurcated, the system's changed. Now, it could be at that point negative feedback kicks in and maintains it the way it is, or it could be you enter another positive feedback loop which is gonna push it and make it flip even again. Oh, okay. um, but what's interesting here is the whole idea of change, here's another flip. So complex system science is really a paradigmatic change going back to sort of Aristotelian thought. You know, it, we, we, we have, it's, it's, a, it's an approach that's much more Aristotelian. Um, so back in the 1700s, Western science saw change before the 1700s. Western science saw change as being something that was cataclysmic. Noah's flood, you know, things like that that the nature of change in the natural world, these cataclysms through the direct intervention of God. But then a geologist named Hutton comes along and says, you know, I'm looking at stuff, and I don't think that's the case. I think I see sediments accruing very constantly and steadily through time. I think I see land masses being pushed up slowly and steadily through time. So Hutton comes in, in the late 1700s as a geologist and says he has his theory of uniformitarianism, which is no. Large-scale change out in the world that we see is gradual and steady. And of course, that dramatically influenced Charles Darwin. So when Darwin gets to his theory of uh, origin of species by natural selection, he sees change as being a very slow, gradual, cumulative thing happening through time. And then in the 1970s, two evolutionary ecologists, um, Gould and Stearns, I mean Gould and, uh, I can't remember his other name, uh, missing it right now, they come out and say, well, actually, that's not the case. When we look at the fossil record, what we see is that everything's staying very static, and then boom, there's large-scale change. And then very static, and then boom, large-scale change. And complex systems theorists that were just coming into play really weighed in with them. They said, well, that makes sense, because that's what we see in positive feedback. The buildup is gradual. The change is building gradually, gradually, gradually but the bifurcation is really clear. And so now we're sort of back to a view of the world that goes back in Western science to the before the 1700s, that large-scale change is rapid and dramatic, but the lead-up to it is gradual and cumulative. So it is, it's a, again, we're going back in a new, into an old paradigm. So the last thing I'd like to say about complex systems before we shift, and we'll come back to this, we'll keep relating this material, <laughs> is this notion of um, emergent properties. All right, so um, Descartes saw, if you knew all the parts in the system, you know how they interacted, you knew the system. The sum of the parts was equal to the whole. Uh, what we realize is that's not the case in complex systems the whole is way greater than the sum of the parts because we get emergent properties. We get properties that emerge from the behavior of the system we cannot predict by looking at the parts and how they interact. So for example, there's no way that a neurophysiologist could look at our brains in terms of the numbers of cells and how they are networked and ever predict emotions like love or hate or a propensity for people to want to be involved in rhythm or music or write poetry, there's no way that that can be predicted. These are all emergent properties that are coming out of the complexity of the system that you could never begin to define by understanding the parts and how they interrelate. Because they're beyond the parts and how they interrelate. They are things that emerge from all those interactions. And you know, every complex system 
because of feedback and all these things develop these emergent properties. Now I said, I think in the early part of this session that um, initially when people started seeing these, these systems, they called them chaotic. Is that you, you couldn't predict what the system's gonna be doing at any point in time. But I said if you scale up <laughs> large temporal scales, they're very conservative. So let's say you're uh, you know, someone who works in LA and you're in the commute during rush hour into the city and out of the city. Um, you know that it's probably gonna take you about three hours. And that if you did the same drive, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, it might only take you, you know, 20 minutes. Um, but you can't predict exactly how much time it's gonna take. So you know it's gonna be longer, you know it's roughly around three hours, sometime it might be three and a half, sometime it might be two hours, 45 minutes. Um, so that's sort of the larger scale conservative behavior of that complex system, is you always know it's gonna take a long time to do the commuter rush hour, but you can never predict exactly what your timing of arrival will be. Um, so that's why I said, you know, we scientists stepped away from this idea of chaotic, to complex systems because they're not chaotic. They, are, they have very conservative behaviors until you reach a bifurcation and then the whole system behavior flips to the world. But any other questions about this? And like, you know, uh, it is new for a lot of people and I'm still amazed that this is not material taught at the undergraduate level. Um, it's, it's really shocking to me that we're so entrenched into a linear reduction into the paradigm in the scientific realm that is still not being taught, and it should be because it's really instructive. Is once you understand complexity, you can you can easily move through any system because the same rules apply regardless of what type of system. So it's very very. Useful. Should be and luckily, uh, I, I know of now seven high school classrooms where this is the focus of the Putney School. They have two classes where the focus is on complex system science. Um, so it is happening, and maybe eventually it will trickle up to the <laughs> undergraduate level. <laughs> Who teaches that? What's that? Who teaches that? Well, there's one, there's, there's two courses. One is an agroecology class, and another is sort of a uh, built environment class. They both have a sustainability focus, and they're both uh, using a lot of complex system science. So uh, Don Zwag teaches one, and Katie Ross teaches the other. And they're the two. Uh, and I'm, I'll proudly say there were students of mine that took you know, my class and they focused on this. And there's a lot of other people I've taught in Antioch that are now teaching this, actually, even elementary grade levels, middle school levels. So it's, it's happening, and it's, it's powerful. Educational bifurcation. Yeah, eventually we'll get there, yes. Yeah. But you know, this gradual build of it takes a long time before the bifurcation. Have the economists bought in? You know, I have not heard any economists working in this room, which is just amazing to me that, you know, uh, I don't know of any economists that are working with a complex systems paradigm. Um, <coughs> they may, I'm sure they're out there, but I don't know of them. But I mean, it's it's really sort of shocking. What about Georgia? Uh, what Georgia? Uh, Pardon? What about uh, Giorgio, Inesco, or Rogan? Oh, okay, yes. R R Rogan would definitely be one. And he actually was the one that actually brought in thermodynamics into the whole discussion. So yeah, he'd definitely be one. Yeah. I can't tell you why economists have not. Yeah. I am an economist. Mm -hmm. One is that they need statistics and more and more reliable statistics to discuss the theory whatever mm -hmm. it is. And I don't know if they can understand what you have mm -hmm. or if they can accept mm -hmm. the theory. I want to know how you today know the temperature of 30,000 years ago mm -hmm. and 5,000 years ago okay. moving from Right. So if you can't hear, he's just saying, he's an economist, he's saying one reason that economists would have trouble with this is they need robust statistics for making predictions. And, you know, this is not about getting those robust statistics. And it may be hard conceptually also. But then you got another question, how do we know what the temperature was back, you know, 18,000 years ago? Um, what, we, what we, the best way we know about this is from what's called isotopic oxygen 18. So the common form of oxygen is oxygen 16, which has eight protons, eight neutrons. That makes its atomic weight 16. But there's a rare form of oxygen, an isotope, that has two additional neutrons, making it oxygen 18. So it's about one-ninth heavier 
than the standard oxygen molecule. So we can use this. We've, the scientists have figured out how to measure amounts of oxygen 18 in ocean sediments and use that as a calibrated thermometer. So when climates are colder, there's more oxygen 18 in the ocean than when it's warmer. Because as the oceans get warmer, it can actually evaporate more readily. But when you have very cold climates, it builds up to higher concentrations. That gets locked into things like carbonate molecules from the still remains of oceanic organisms, which then drift down to the sediments. So they can go to any sedimentary layer, they can carbon date to get an age on it, and they can test the amount of oxygen 18 there and have a pretty good way to measure temperatures. So they've been able to measure uh, temperatures around the globe through that way and have mapped it out pretty nicely in that way. So that's how they're getting the, the temperature data. Um, indigenous cultures uh, were very attuned with their environments. And of course, um, really, until we get into certain agricultural societies, people see themselves as being a part of those systems. They don't see themselves as being a part of it. They're one of the players equally involved in everything with all the organisms that are there. They see themselves as a part of that system. They see how it all is interrelated. It's just it's a very natural way to see the world. Um, we don't really get that shift until we start to get into certain agricultural societies where all of a sudden people see themselves as being separated from the system, you know, having dominion over it, being able to control it. And all of a sudden that break where we don't see ourselves part of the system, a lot of that relationality is lost. Um, and you know, it's, it's very lost in a culture like ours. People just don't understand their interconnectedness with everything else in our systems. It's, and it's, you know, um, it's completely skewed by media, advertising, all sorts of stuff. You know, we just, we don't have a healthy picture of what's really going on. Um, so it is culturally derived. All right, so what I'd like to shift gears now and move away from complex systems, we will come back to these concepts because they'll come up again as we're going through material. But what I'd like to do now is move in to the second law of thermodynamics. So as I mentioned, there's two major physical laws of thermodynamics. The first law is the law of conservation of energy that states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, these laws came into existence in the middle of the 19th century. They've been tested innumerable times, and nobody has been ever able to do something where they conclusively can create or destroy energy. So <clears throat> if that is not happening anywhere in the universe, what that means is that all the energy in the universe today is exactly what it was about 13 billion years ago when this universe was spawned. None's been created or none's been destroyed. So it's a very, very profound idea. But from, let's say, a sustainability lens, it's the second law that is much more important for us to understand. And the second law of thermodynamics is called the law of transformation of energy. It says, all right, we can't create or destroy energy, but we can transform it from one form to another. So right now, um, you know, in some sort of electric generating plant, maybe, uh, I guess it's not Vermont Yankee because that's not operating anymore, but somewhere, something is being done where energy is being converted, possibly Hydro-Quebec, where kinetic energy of motion of water is being converted into electricity. That's a transformation. That electricity comes in these fluorescent bulbs, and electricity is transformed into light. So we can't really destroy energy, but it can be transformed from one state to another. But the critical factor about the second law is that within a system, so here again, it's important to know what, what skill you're at, Within a system, whenever a transformation occurs, it's never 100% efficient. And during the transformation, some of the energy is lost from that system, usually as heat. Now, that might not seem like a very big thing, that you know, because these transformations can't be 100% efficient, that some of the energy is lost. But it has huge implications. Because for any system that can take in energy and give off energy, they can be in one of three energetic states. So let me just map these out. <clears throat> so the first state, and I'll just use a, a box here to say here's the system. The first state is when the energy coming into the system 
is greater than the energy leaving the system due to the transformations within the system. This is what's called a neg or anti-entropic system. And anti-entropic systems, because they're taking in more energy they're giving off, they store that energy in growth. So in our developmental years, we were all anti-entropic systems. Now I remember when my niece, Margie, had her three boys, which were, they were all very close together in age. They ranged from uh, five to seven and a half. And I remember at that time, they were all very finicky eaters. They'd eat a little bit of macaroni and cheese. They might eat a strawberry. That was lunch, and then they'd rush outside, and they'd run around for hours. I'd be looking at them saying, this is not possible. They've got, to be, they've got to be bleeding off way more energy from the metabolic transformations than they took in. And yet I was wrong, because every time I saw them, they, they were bigger. I was like, oh, this is they're taking in more energy, they're bleeding off. So we were all in that state. And usually, um, for complex systems, these are, this is when we're having a lot of positive feedback loops. These are, we're developing those developmental phases are coming in bifurcations as we grow. Then when systems reach maturity, and we can call these dynamic equilibrium systems, the amount of energy coming into the system is the same as the amount of energy coming out of the system, and as a result, growth stops. So that's pretty much the case with all of us. We reach maturity, growth stops. We take in about 2,000 food calories of energy a day, and we bleed off about 2,000 food calories, and growth stops. But the third state is a state where there is less energy entering the system than is being lost through the transformations. And this is what is called an entropic system. And entropy is a process that as a system loses energy, it's said to move from a state of order to disorder. But order and disorder are really subjective terms. So I can remember when Libby and I were colleagues at the Putney School, for part of the time I was there, I was the dorm head in Noise Dorm. And every Sunday, I do room inspections. <laughs> because the idea was to try to help the girls in my dorm keep their rooms a little bit more orderly so it didn't cause any, you know, tensions or problems. And I can assure you, my sense of order and their sense of order was really, really different. I mean, I remember one student's sense of order was just take everything and shove it in the closet or push it under the bed. And I'd say, no, that doesn't look very orderly. So I don't think order and disorder are good ways to describe entropy. Much more uh, objective ways of describing it are in tropic systems, they lose energy, go from a state of complexity toward simplicity. And from a state of concentration toward diffusion. Um, that's a much more objective way of looking at entropy. Again, in tropic systems, they lose energy, move towards simplicity move towards diffusion of energy and materials. Um, now, if entropy is a new topic for you, don't worry. You have fought against it your entire <laughs> lives. <laughs> when I was writing my book, The Myth of Progress, I calculated that my wife, Marcia, and I, at that time, had probably cleaned our house 1,500 times. I thought, oh my god, 1,500 times, that's a lot. Why didn't we just do it a hundred? You know, why not just do it a <laughs> And the reason is that every time we move in our abodes, we're creating entropy. You know, you walk down the hall and maybe the inside of your pant legs rub a little bit together, and fibers of material drift off to diffuse as dust in the room. You know, you sit down with maybe a Sunday edition of the New York Times, and you're flipping the pages slowly but the air resistance causes some paper fibers to drift off and diffuse as dust into the room. Uh, the books that were all neatly on the bookshelf start coming off. And there's a book here, and then a book here, and then a book here, and they start diffusing around the house. And you don't get the laundry in time. The laundry hamper starts to overflow, and then the clothes start diffusing across the floor, and socks can diffuse amazing things. And, you know, company is coming over, and it's like, wow, this place is really a mess. And what do you do? You invest energy to reconcentrate everything. 
So you go and you wash all the laundry. But you not only do that, most people then put the underwear with the underwear, the t-shirts with the t-shirts, the socks with the socks. You pick up all your books, you put them back in the bookshelf, you wash all your dishes, the forks go with the forks, spoons with the spoons, knives with the knives, plates in the plate cupboard, glasses in the glass cupboard. You may even go around with a vacuum cleaner and suck up all that diffused dust and reconcentrate in the vacuum cleaner bag. And everything is like really nicely concentrated now. And you have like a large, you know, party. A lot of company comes over. At the end of the night, you look around and say, "God, this place is a mess." You know? <laughs> so, whatever we do, we're creating entropy. Um, it's you know something we're always sort of fighting against, um, and we do it by investing energy to reconcentrate and create, make, create systems that have greater complexity. Um, now, the rates at which energy is transformed in a system directly relate to the rate at which entropy happens. So in the myth of progress, I use an example to get this point across. I ask people to imagine two identical rooms. And each room is outfitted with beautiful, delicate, antique items. So, you know, glass vases and Ming vases and, you know, floor to ceiling old tapestries and a, a library of delicate leather bound books and all these very delicate, beautiful old things. And so in one of the rooms, we're just gonna put an elderly individual with a Sunday edition New York Times for one hour. They're gonna be in there reading the paper. They're gonna create a little bit of entropy because a little bit of dust is gonna diffuse out, but not too bad. But in the other room, we're just gonna put a two and a half year old, unsupervised, just gonna put him in there and close the door for an hour. I think you can sense which room is gonna be more entropic. And it's not because toddlers are inherently destructive, they're just eager to understand the world around them. They're investing a lot of energy in that process, and they're creating a lot of transformations in that process. Um, so again, the rate at which energy is transformed very much determines the rate at which entropy is happening. Now, the reason this is critical to understand is this is the foundation for why our current system is not sustainable. Um, every environmental problem you can think of is a problem of entropy. They all are. Do you think of loss of erosion due to do industrial agriculture? That's an entropic process. We're taking very complex systems in soil, simplifying them, and not only that, we are causing the um, uh, release of nutrients in those systems, which means there's diffusion of nutrients out of those soils. If it's nutrients like phosphorus that get into estuaries or lakes like Lake Champlain, they can create algal blooms, which can create anoxic conditions. You get even further entropy as those systems are simplified. Uh, the overfishing of the world's oceans is an entropic process. We've taken very complex marine ecosystems and dramatically simplified them. Uh, removal right now of primary tropical rainforest in Brazil for soybean plantations for biofuels is an entropic process. You're taking very complex ecosystems and replacing them with much more simplified monocultures. Um, burning of uh, fossil fuels, an entropic process. We're taking concentrated stores of carbon and diffusing them out in the atmosphere. Uh, every single environmental problem we're witnessing today is a problem of entropy. It's at the very foundation of all the environmental woes we're seeing in this planet. Now, I should mention, <coughs> life has been on this planet for 3.8 billion years. Um, for the first three and a half billion years, the Earth was an anti-entropic system. It was taking in more energy through the capture of photosynthesis than was being released as heat back into outer space. And all that increased captured energy built up all the biomass on this planet, built up all these fossil fuel beds, build up our oxygen atmosphere at 21% because before life was here, we didn't have any free oxygen in the atmosphere. So for the first 3.5 billion years, Earth is an anti-entropic system of the biosphere. Then, about 300 million years ago, uh, we become a dynamic, the biosphere becomes a dynamic equilibrium system. We know that because oxygen levels in the atmosphere have been very stable over that time frame, which means the amount of energy captured through photosynthesis is equal to the amount of energy released through the metabolism of all the biota, and the Earth became mature. But for the first time in its history, in the last century or so, we are now an entropic system. We are pushing 10% more heat 
in the outer space that is being replaced by solar gain being captured through photosynthesis. So what that means is we are releasing as a human species through our transformations more energy to the to the to outer space than we're reclaiming. And that means the Earth for the first time has become an entropic system and it's becoming more and more entropic every year as our collective use of energy keeps going up and up and up. Um, so that's the frame why this is not sustainable. So what we're involved in here is our use of energy as a positive feedback loop. You know, we're continuously increasing our use of energy and the ironic thing is that even as we develop more energy efficient technologies in a culture like ours, per capita consumption continues to go up. And a lot of that energy is embedded energy in the material items we have. So we might be able to develop technologies that can make our houses very energy efficient, but then our houses that used to be 1,500 feet grow out to 4,000 feet. An incredible amount of embedded energy in those materials. So what we're seeing is even with you know, increases in our energy efficiency technologies, our per capita consumption keeps going up. Um, and this is a positive feedback loop, and it's pushing the Earth towards more and more entropic conditions. And eventually, because that larger scale can have negative feedback, as we degrade the environment, that's going to start feeding back on us, probably climate change being one of the most significant feedback loops. Eventually, it is going to curtail that growth. It's not a question of what, if it's going to happen. It's a question of when it's going to happen. We just can't keep moving in this trajectory. Eventually, the de degradation from entropy will be at the point where the feedback will be so immense it will start taking the infrastructure apart in our systems. Yeah. yeah. How long ago did you say it started shifting to entropic? Probably in the last one to two centuries. Wow. Probably with the, the, the move towards all of a sudden using fossil fuels. Dramatically increased the amount of per capita energy consumption by humans. And at the same time, with med medical technology coming along, the germ therapy, and trapping into petroleum, which is an incredibly potent energy resource because it's so malleable and energy dense. The combination of those two things in the latter part of the 19th century is what vaulted this dramatic population growth we've seen. So not only is our population growing, but we're each individual is using more and more and more. And that's just exasperating us in a very dramatic positive feedback. What's happening, whenever you're looking at an energy resource, a real critical thing to look at is what's called energy return on energy investment. We don't often think about this, but um, we really should be, because that becomes really critical. When we first started tapping into petroleum back in the late 1800s, we'd get about 120 units of energy out for every unit of energy we invested in the process of drilling and extraction. You know, now we're down to around 12 to maybe 14 units of energy out for every energy you invested is all the easily accessible stuff has been consumed. Now we're having to drill deeper and more complex ways. And eventually, you know, that's going to get down to such a small margin return. There'll still be petroleum down there, but it's going to be so costly to get that it's going to probably curtail our use um, in that regard. But, you know, we still have other technologies we can use. Some are much better than others. You know, things like micro hydro give incredible energy return on energy investment, like sometimes as much as 200 units of energy for every unit invested. So we've got to move to the technologies that give us the best energy return on energy investment, but we have got to now also become frugal in our use of energy. The technologies on their own right are not going to solve the problem. We have got to also now become highly aware of energy use and really be frugal about it, and not waste it. Um, Really, really critical to the future well-being of you know our offspring and their offspring and all the other critters on this planet and organisms that exist. Any questions on this? Um, this is not rocket science. It's very simple. Most people don't know you know the second law and how it works in open systems with energy, but it's the key. Now, let me just make an analogy here for 3.8 billion years. It's an incredible amount of time, so it's very hard to conceptualize. So let's say we have a standard sheet of paper, and think of the thickness equaling a century. Um, if I put two sheets of paper on the floor, that pretty much represents the tenure of industrial Western culture in this planet. Um, and I'd say a lot of our current thinkers would say, you know, the system's not perfect, but 
we can tweak the parts, is it sustainable? And I would counter that it's probably not. We don't really change dramatically how we're doing things. Uh, the system won't be sustainable. Eventually, the feedback will change it. Um, if I put a 10-inch stack of paper on the floor, that would represent the tenure of, of Homo sapiens, modern Homo sapiens on this planet, 200,000 years. But how high a stack would we need to get 3.8 billion years? It'd be a stack over three miles in height. Each sheet in that three miles representing a century. Um, the biosphere has not only sustained itself through that run, it's thrived. And the reason it's done that is because the biosphere is engaged and always working towards energy efficiency and using that as a means to build high levels of self-organization. And that is a very sustainable model that we have to look at. So the second law tells us why our current trajectory is not sustainable. As we move um, next week into self-organization, that's going to give us a model of how we can create very sustainable systems, modeling after our bodies, which are highly self-organized, modeling after ecosystems, and even modeling after other human systems that have been highly self-organized because that have been quite, quite sustainable. So I think we'll leave the second law um, and its relationship to entropy um, as we move towards going into self-organization. But any questions about the second law before we do that? Right now, we are using more energy so what that means is, in our system, we are bleeding off more energy. A lot of it that's been trapped in biomass in the form of fossil fuels over hundreds of millions of years. We are combusting that at huge rates. And because of that activity, we've also structured the biosphere of the Earth where the photosynthetic gain is not as great as it used to be. So we've declined the amount of energy coming in, at the same time accelerate the energy going out, and that's the imbalance. We have so much more energy going out that is being replaced, and that's making the biosphere entropic. But when we, most of us think, of, our customers think of this in terms of chemical balance of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the energy going out means more carbon entering the atmosphere. That's right, because if these yeah. things were in balance like they are here, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere would be even keeled. Yeah. Um, oxygen would be very even keeled. Now, oxygen, there's so much of it, we can't really measure the declines. It is going down, but we're still around 21%. But uh, the carbon dioxide, there's so little of it, we can really see it increasing. So sending carbon in the atmosphere creates more carbon dioxide. It's, what's happening is, um, it's this thing right here. We're taking concentrated stores of carbon from fossil fuels, yeah. releasing the energy as heat, which eventually drifts out in outer space, and then we're getting diffusion, both energy and the carbon dioxide, which used to be concentrated in things like coal and petroleum, uh, and now it's diffused out into the atmosphere. And that's the result of entropy, moving from concentration to diffusion. Any other questions or comments? All right, so we'll come back to this a bit because energy is really going to become a very important theme through the rest of the, the three sessions we're doing. Uh, it's going to be really, really important because it's the foundation of everything. Uh, matter of fact, we cannot think of anything that is not a form of energy. Everything that exists is a form of energy. So what I'd like to do now um, is get into some community ecology and uh, start to do this by framing out different forms of symbiotic interactions. So in ecology, ecology has various scales that ecologists look at, and um, community ecology is one of those scales. So for example, uh, one scale of ecology is what's called physiological ecology. And physiological ecology is a branch of ecology where researchers are just looking at the interaction of organisms to their physical environment. Um, so for example, if you're uh, in Arctic hair, your body's gonna be a lot bigger than if you're, let's say, you know, a snowshoe hare down in these climes. Because if you're up in the Arctic, you're gonna need a bigger body just to have a lower surface area to volume ratio so you don't bleed off heat so fast. So that would be sort of a, 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 a like a physio physiological ecology sort of focus, looking at how organisms are adapted to their physical environment. 
what are the adaptations they have to survive in that environment. <coughs> Another branch of ecology is population ecology. And here, people that work in this branch of ecology are mostly focused on the interactions of individuals in a population. <coughs> so there's a look at mating behaviors of organisms, territoriality, um, you know, brood rearing, things like that. All the interactions that happen between individuals of the population. And then we also have community ecology. And in community ecology, community ecologists are focused on the interactions between organisms of different species. You know, predator-prey relationships, mutualistic relationships between different species of organisms, competition between different species. So the focus in all these is on interactions, but here, interaction with the physical environment, here with interactions with members of your own species, here with interactions of individuals of different species. So we're going to be working at this, this level of community ecology. Now, what we're going to do with that is we're going to look at the different types of interactions that can occur between species. And this gets us into the realm of what are called the ecological symbioses. Now, most people that have heard this word symbiosis know it from the biological context. Uh, biologists define symbiosis <clears throat> as any interaction between two individuals of different species that's mutually beneficial. That's the sort of common understanding. In ecology, ecologists have a broader view of symbiosis because they see these interactions changing through time. They're not static. So to ecologists, the symbiosis is just any interaction between two individuals of different species. It doesn't have to be positive. It could be negative. Uh, it doesn't really matter because uh, they have a, a, a larger framing. So in ecological symbiosis, since this is always a one-on-one -on -one interaction, an individual may be benefited, an individual may be harmed, or an individual might not be affected by the interaction at all. And we can use this, the symbol of a, a zero for that. So what we're going to do, taking any combination of two of those three symbols, we can map out all the different ecological symbioses. So someone just give me a combination of any two of these three symbols that we want to take. Positive. Okay. What's that? Positive. And? Positive. And? Two. And a negative. All right. Positive and a negative. All right. So we actually have two different symbioses depending on whether the individual that is harmed is killed or not. So if the individual is killed in this interaction, what do you think the name of this symbiosis is? It's, well, yes, lethal. <laughs> not murder, but lethal, yes, but I think I heard, I heard predation. So this is an ecological interaction where one individual benefits, the other one is killed in the process. Um, that's predation. What if the individual that is harmed is not killed? What is it called then? Competition. Not competition. We'll get to that one later. Yeah. Parasitism. Dominance. Not commensalism. Dominance. No. Parasitism. 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 Now, we've got to expand our thinking here. Parasites are not just small blood-sucking things like ticks and mosquitoes and black flies. <laughs> And predators are not just big things with big teeth and claws. So um, we recently moved across the river over New Hampshire, but when we were living in Vermont, uh, one of our neighbors at one point had two types of livestock in the pasture we abutted. One were these sort of large, ungainly animals, all blotched and black and white. And there was a fewer, more sort of graceful, elegant, uh, animals that longer legs that the uh, our neighbor used to like to ride around the back of. <laughs> so I think you know what animals I'm talking about here. <laughs> All right, cows and horses. One is a predator and one is a parasite. Which is which? Towards each other. Not towards each other. 
So the human is a predator when they eat the cow? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not talking about the human. I'm talking about the cow and the horse. The oh. cow and the horse are involved in, one of them involved in predatory interactions with other organisms, one involved in parasitic interactions with other organisms. Is, this, is that the digestion of seeds or something? Or? It's close. It's not the digestion eating, itself. Eating of grass as opposed to eating hay? Well, you're, you're very close. It's how they eat. So one, the way they eat plants makes one potentially a predator and one only a parasite. Mm -hmm. So ruminants, ruminants. Well, cows have this grasping tongue. They can yeah. actually pull out entire plants. Okay. So they'd be a plant predator. So they can actually eat the whole plant. Whereas horses can't do that. They <laughs> nibble down, so they'd solely be a parasite. Now, I think one of my favorite movies when I was growing up was Bambi. I think Walt Disney's first, you know, animated cartoon about wildlife. Um, I didn't realize until I got to, to graduate school that every character in Bambi was a parasite. Bambi was a parasite. Bambi's mom was a parasite. Thumper the rabbit was a parasite. <laughs> if you're a plant, all those organisms are plant parasites. Right? So we got to expand our thinking here a bit. Now, you don't have to eat your prey to be a predator. You just have to kill it. So when we built our first house in Vermont, I cut down 110 white pine trees <coughs> for building material. I killed the trees, I didn't eat them, but I used their embedded energy to build the structure of my house. So at what point does something go from a parasite to a predator in terms of like ticks on moose? Like one tick on a moose won't kill it, but... <coughs> if eventually you get such a parasitic load that it causes the death of the host, the relationship just shifted from parasitism to predation. Okay. And you'd be then looking at a pack parasite. Like, instead of a pack of wolves, a pack of, you know, thousands and thousands of ticks. So, so parasitism, the, the, the other organism is being negatively affected, but not, not the other. Exactly. So they're, they're, and one way to think about this, again, is from an energy perspective. Whenever you're gaining energy as an organism out there, you're benefiting. Whenever you're losing energy, you're being harmed. Uh, so this usually means a loss of energy in some ways in the interaction. All right, how about another pair of symbols? So we use plus and negative together. Let's see if we can get another pair. Negative zero. Negative zero. I'm going to put this one down here. This is called amensalism. And this is pretty much always an accidental interaction. And there's no benefit for something to be harmed and the other organism not even impacted at all. So as we get into like um, the fall around here, we get these really nice foggy mornings um, when uh, you know fog has formed in the river valley and maybe built up uh, in the surrounding hills. Um, we can go out in those mornings and we can see red Fs all over the ground in our forests. Um, now undoubtedly, we've been out walking and there's been a red F under an oak leaf we didn't even know was there. We stepped on the oak leaf might have squished the poor critter. It was definitely harmed. We weren't impacted at all because we didn't even know the relationship happened. Um, so amensalism, pretty much always an accidental interaction. And because of that, it's not going to be very, not going to be very important in our scheme of things. But it's important to map it out. So how about another pair of symbols? A negative. 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 Negative usually because of energy losses involved in the interaction. So anyone know? I've heard, actually, someone mentioned this already. Um, they used it instead of parasitism. So what do you think this is called? Competition. Competition, right. Now, this is where we've got to change our thinking. Often we look at competition in a human context as being a good thing. Matter of fact, you know, every four years, people from around the world flock together in the Olympics to compete. Um, but in the natural world, it's not a good thing. It's both individuals are losing energy. In competition at, at this time of year can be really brutal. There's, you know, our animals out there are on such a tight energy budget. They can't afford to just lose energy. Um, so that's why it's seen as negative negative. And as we're going to see, what often happens is if species or individuals of different species can figure out how to coexist without energy losses from competition, it's a benefit for them. So competition is going to become a potent force for actually driving species to specialize so they can coexist without energy losses. Right, how about another pair of symbols? Uh, 
Double plus. Double plus. And there's two of these. Based on whether the interaction is obligatory for survivorship. If the individuals have to interact to survive, it's called uh, mutualism. Um, if they don't, it's called proto-cooperation. So both are fairly common, and for it to be a mutualism, it has to be obligatory for at least one of the two individuals. So for example, lichens are a mutualism. Uh, the algae in our lichens can be free living. It can make it on its own, but when it interacts with um, the correct fungus to, that it interacts with, it benefits because it expands the number of substrates it can colonize. But the fungus itself can only exist when interacting with the correct algae. So it's obligatory for the fungus making it a mutualism. But in most of these cases, mutualisms are obligatory for both parties. Um, ants probably have more mutualisms than any other organisms on this planet. Um, like humans, they're the only other organisms I know of that herd animals and milk them in their secretions. So around here, um, especially on aspen whips coming up, or sometimes on goldenrod, you'll find these colonies of, of flightless aphids. These are aphids that have no wings. And with those aphids, you're gonna see ants that are tending them. And if you touch that plant, those ants are going to swarm you and start biting you. They are there to protect the aphids because they're, they're taking care of them. If the stem starts losing sap to the point it's no longer productive, the ants pick up their aphids and move them to another stem because they, they're taking them to a new fresh pasture. Uh, and then when the ants get hungry, they take their antennae and they rub the sides of the aphid <coughs> right off of the posture of the end. The aphid comes out as a nice globule of honeydew, which is a very sugary, sweet secretion. That's what the ants consume to get their energy. Um, if you remove the ants from the, the aphids, they'll die because they need that honeydew because they're so highly specialized to it. And if you remove the ants from the aphids, the aphids will die because they can't do anything to take care of themselves. So as we move through the fall, the ants around here collect all the aphid eggs. They go down underground. They all overwinter underground, sort of hibernating. And then in the spring, they come back up, take the eggs, put them on the appropriate pastures out there, and tend them through the summer and milk them in their secretions. Ants also have a huge array of mutualisms uh, with fungi. So all of our leaf cutting ant species take leaf material, build compost piles that is inoculated with a fungus. Those fungi can only grow on the compost pile that has the correct ant saliva in it. So again, both mutually obligatory. Uh, can anyone think of examples of proto-cooperative relationships where both parties benefit, but if they don't interact, they can still survive. Uh, some, exa some examples of mimicry. Um, mimicry is usually to hide from a predator or to hide from a prey. So it's probably it's more related to predator-prey interactions. But don't both of the mimics benefit? Okay, so, all right, so yes, you're right. In what is called malarian mimicry, right. they both benefit. So malarian mimics, a good example are in bees, wasps, and hornets. They all have um, the banded yellow and black abdomen. Just to make it easier to remember, you see that, that means it's dangerous. So um, they are benefiting each other, um, and yet if one of the species was extinguished, the others would probably be fine. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh, around here, pretty much all of our pollination <coughs> systems are proto-cooperative. You know, we go out in one of our meadows in the middle of the summer, we can find all sorts of different species of moths and butterflies, bees, flies, beetles, all pollinating. Um, and they're pollinating a variety of plants, so if any one plant happens to extinct, they're going to be fine. If any one pollinator goes extinct, they'll be fine. It's all proto-cooperative. It's not host-specific. Once it becomes host-specific, it becomes mutualistic. All right, we have two more to go here. Let's just quickly get them and then we'll break for the day. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. I'll put that down at the very bottom here. Uh, this is called neutralism. This is more like a Zen koan. <laughs> is it possible to have an interaction where neither party is affected? I'll let you contemplate that. <laughs> um, in any case, not very important to the scheme of things here. So one more to go. Plus zero. Plus zero. And this is commensalism. 
And this is where you know one party benefits, the other one's not affected. Um, what would you think tapping a sugar maple would be between human and sugar maple? Tapping it with sap. What's that relationship? Parasite? You think parasitism. Obviously, we're doing it to get the energy resource and that really nice stuff we can make in a little syrup. And yeah, the tree is losing energy. But sometimes we have to look at the whole interaction here. What if someone who's doing the tapping is running a pretty good sugar bush and taking out competitors such that the energy taken from the tree is equal by the energy boost from removal of competition? That's become commensalistic. Whenever you get a zero-sum game in the energy department, it's commensalistic. If the energy boost in the tree by removing competitors is even greater than the energy removal, now that interaction is pretty cooperative. Um, so sometimes you have to know the whole energetic story here. But we will just stop there for today. We're going to come back and pick this up uh, next week when we meet. And what we're going to see is that these aren't static. That driven by energy efficiency through time, the nature of these interactions can change. But I just wanted to get them out. And when we're out in the field next week, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at different forms of symbiotic interactions and talk about how they pull up all the time. So that's what we're doing next week.